Thank y'all for the music. Last week, our student pastor, Mike Rossinet, preached an excellent sermon. Thank you, Mike. If you didn't hear it, check it out on video. Among other things, Mike urged us to pay attention in the biblical narrative and in our world to pay attention to those who may feel forgotten or overlooked to the most vulnerable people. We as Christians and as humans do the hard work of unearthing their stories then and now so that we can acknowledge past oppression and pain and hopefully repent from it. Those first steps are necessary if we want to commit ourselves to acts of restorative justice. In the Bible, we often misread, mistranslate, or allow ourselves to forget ugly truths that are found there. Maybe because they don't directly impact us, or so we think. Sometimes we feel so far removed from the stories and characters we meet in the pages of the Bible that we really don't consider the relevance they have for us today. It's as we look closely at biblical stories, we often find that they are not only about a few characters a long time ago, sometimes with strange names, they are also stories that keep happening. They happen again and again and again. That is certainly the case in the story that Mike explored last week of Ruth and Ruth's mother-in-law, Naomi. The text gives us clues about what their relationship might have been like when Ruth addresses Naomi with those beautiful and often quoted words, where you go, I will go. Where you abide, I will abide. Your people shall be my people, and your God, my God. I confess, whenever I hear those words at a straight wedding, I just want to raise my hand and say, (laughs) everybody realizes that those are words spoken by one woman to another woman, right? Just want to make sure y'all know that. We know that Naomi is Ruth's mother-in-law. Maybe there is more to their relationship, but we don't know, nor does it ultimately matter. The power of story does not depend on factuality. As Marcus Borg would often say, I don't know if it happened this way or not, but I do know that this is an important and true story. There was intense love and loyalty between Ruth and Naomi. Their story is important, and here is an important truth that it reveals. Women have always been exploited. Women have always been forced to use their bodies to survive. It is a tale as old as time itself. We're going to continue a bit with Ruth's story. First, just a reminder of what has happened in the story up to this point. Ruth and Naomi have returned to Bethlehem after the deaths of the male family members. They are two women, alone, vulnerable. Ruth works in the fields to support them. The field where she works is owned by a man named Boaz, who is a relative of Naomi's deceased husband. I begin reading in Ruth chapter 3. Naomi, Ruth's mother-in-law, said to her, My daughter, I need to seek some security for you so that it may be well with you. Now here is our kinsman, Boaz, with whose young women you've been working. See, he's winnowing barley tonight at the threshing floor. Naomi tells Ruth what she must do. She says, now wash and anoint yourself and put on your best clothes and go down to the threshing floor. But do not make yourself known to him until he has finished eating and drinking. When he lies down, observe the place where he lies and then go, uncover his feet and lie down and he will tell you what to do. You do understand what Naomi is telling Ruth to do, 
right? It's important to make the implicit explicit. She's saying, in order for us to survive, to be protected, you must have sex with him. She says, go to him, uncover his feet. Feet is a clear euphemism for genitals. Ruth is to have sex with Boaz, whether she wants to or not, she has to do it in order to survive in their society. Like countless other women in our biblical narrative and in our world today, <clears throat> excuse me, Ruth no longer has control of her own body. She has to have sex. Does she want to? Does she love him? Will she get pregnant? Can she support a baby? It doesn't matter. Her body isn't hers. As I said, it is a reality as old as time. Last Saturday morning, I got up early and I headed to Whole Women's Health, a woman's clinic just off Camp Bowie. Whole Women's Health is founded on the principle that everyone must be at the center of their own health care decisions. They are committed to providing health care to women, to destigmatizing abortion, and creating safe spaces for all people. A call had gone out for clergy to show up at the clinic last Saturday. Clergy, that is, who support a woman's right to have as much control as possible over her own body. Clergy who believe that women have the right to care for themselves, to pursue their futures, to live their lives as they see fit. If a woman is not in control of her fertility, she is not in control of her life. Last Saturday, Whole Women's Health invited supportive clergy then to be present because they were expecting a potentially large presence of anti-abortion activists that day. There's a particular group that organizes protests in various places in the country, around the country. I won't say their name here because I do not wish to extend publicity to them. They are a Christian group who stages demonstrations at abortion clinics. They call those demonstrations, quote, worship at the gates of hell, end quote. On social media, they indicated that they were headed to Fort Worth. It looked like they might, might draw a significant number of folks, and there was concern that they might seek to intimidate or interfere with women coming in for appointments that day. So clergy were there to support women, to escort women from their cars into the clinic, and if necessary, perhaps help to shield them from photographers who might be present. Did you know that almost every single day at Whole Women's Health and at clinics across the country that provide abortions, you'll find demonstrators, people with signs and crosses, shouting or singing or standing quietly as if in vigil. Think for a moment about how it would feel to you to have to pass through people shouting at you in order to access critical health care. You might be there for one of a number of reasons. It might come at a time when you're emotionally vulnerable or afraid. And for this potential damage to be done in the name of Christ is so distressing to me. We live in a state that has enacted abortion restrictions that violate women's fundamental rights. Abortion, which has been ruled to be protected under the Constitution, is effectively banned in our state before most women can know that they are pregnant. There are no exemptions for rape, for incest, or for fetal health. It is an attack against women in general, and particularly against women in situations of poverty. Women with means can more likely take time off work and fly to another state for an abortion if needed. It's an option that's not available to everyone. 
Now, response to this reality is received differently by different people. Some are outraged and deeply troubled. Others are pleased with progress towards banning abortions entirely. They see themselves as protectors of unborn babies. They believe that life begins at conception, and they are committed to preserving life. I have no wish to demonize those with whom I disagree. I understand their position, but I do not agree with it for a number of reasons. I'm going to name them quickly now, and we're going to spend more time on them next week. First, there is simply no scientific consensus on when life begins. From a biological perspective, life is a process. If I believed an embryo to be a fully formed human being, then I would stand with my opponents. But life is not a switch that turns on in an instant. In addition to science, there's the Bible. Next week, we're going to look at what the Bible has to say relative to abortion. You might be surprised by what we find there. Abortion is a complicated issue, so we're going to take some time to explore it from different perspectives. I am convinced that as a Christian living in Texas, I must bear witness to the harm that's being done right now to women and families as a direct result of this new law. You may not be in a situation where you're directly impacted. But we are compelled as Christians and as humans to work for justice. If something is not a problem for me personally, it still can be a problem. In Texas these days, we might be talking about voter suppression or racism or the death penalty or the grid. Many important topics demand our attention and advocacy We're just starting with reproductive justice. Earlier this week, I had a conversation with a member of our congregation to discuss how the new abortion law is impacting women and their families. She's not able to be here today, so we recorded it, and I'm going to close with it today. And I do want to say, uh, before we show this video, that our discussion is about pregnancy and problems encountered in pregnancy. There's nothing graphic, but if that's triggering for you, you might want to step away for just a couple of minutes. Three, two. I'm joined by Jen Wagner. Jen and her family are members of our congregation, and I really thank you for being here. Can you tell the folks what you do? Yes, I am a women's health nurse at a busy hospital here in North Texas. Uh Now, we have been having some discussions about what it's really like for healthcare workers and the women and their families, the kinds of situations that are happening. Of course, we're mindful about privacy, and we're not going to talk any kind of specifics, but can you share the kinds of situations that you're seeing at work? Mm -hmm. It's been hard because the kind of care we would usually provide to women sometimes is not allowed with this new legislation. So we've seen some suffering families. Um, Imagine a woman whose water breaks too soon, just a few months into her pregnancy, but she hasn't miscarried yet. So she sits and waits for her beloved baby's heart to stop beating, all the time worried about her growing risk of infection, putting her own life at threat. Now, before this law, how would you have treated, or what options would have been available for a woman in that situation? In the past, we could have given medication to start the contractions. Um, Since this isn't a pregnancy that could have been carried to term, and this isn't a baby that can live outside the womb, but now we're not allowed to do that. We just have to wait and try to treat the infection if it develops. And she sits and waits for however long it takes, Mm -hmm. knowing that she doesn't have a viable baby. Mm -hmm. Yes, what else? Um, Another story we've seen, um, you could picture a woman who comes to the emergency room sick, bleeding, telling half-truths about her history because she is terrified 
of being sued and paying fines for traveling out of state to have an abortion. Right. The law uh, puts the $10,000 bounty, essentially, uh, for someone to turn in, someone who's had an abortion or who helped a woman get an abortion. Yeah, and this might be someone who had enough resources to travel out of state for the procedure, but responsibilities at home that made her come back before she could get the follow-up care, um, that's been a common situation. Oh, gosh. Um, another situation is you might think of a young couple who learns through ultrasound and genetic tests that their baby has no chance of surviving after birth. Um, and they are told to expect to miscarry and given the warning signs and every few days show up uh, thinking that this is the time. But when there is still a heartbeat, we send them home to continue to wait, prolonging their grief as they try to get on with their normal life for days and weeks. And it's not everyone who is, maybe there are other children, maybe they have work, maybe transportation issues that's able just to come back again and again and just the... Right. A trip to the hospital is never a quick trip. Yeah, the trauma of waiting. Gosh, I, I know of one situation that another uh, healthcare worker told me about where a woman knew she was pregnant, came to the clinic to have, couldn't have the child, and came to the clinic um, and wanted to have an abortion and they they couldn't see anything in the sonogram, so they couldn't she give very, the medication. Very, early in pregnancy. Very, yeah. very early in pregnancy. Uh, two days later, she came back, and they could detect it's not a heartbeat, but they could, what, what is it called? For, uh, I, I'd use the word cardiac activity, since it's yeah. not really anything like a, like a baby's heart yet. Right, right. But of course, when that's detected, it's mm -hmm. too late. So there's just this very tiny window and we're not saying, <coughs> excuse me, we're not saying, you're not saying, uh, and neither am I, that women in these situations would choose an abortion. Mm -hmm. they, they may or may not. Right. Um, it's just that it's an option that no longer is available to them that is resulting in tremendous right. suffering. Yeah, none of these women, none of these families take the decision to end a pregnancy lightly and neither do the doctors and nurses caring for them. Um, and in my experience, the families often agonize about what is the right decision. Mm -hmm. um, and I support that decision if they decide not sure. to have a therapy abortion. I'm all about their right to make that decision. It's just that this law doesn't allow them to choose. This law is not letting us trust women to make the decision for themselves about what is right. Well, Jim, thank you so much for your openness and for sharing this information with us. And we will keep praying for you and your work and for all the healthcare providers thank who you. are trying to support women during this really difficult time. Thank you. Thank you again, <clears throat> Jim. As a Christian, I am so tired of seeing my religion used to shame those who are self-determining their reproductive lives. I am tired of seeing the hurt and pain and judgment that my religion causes to so many people instead of the love and compassion that they deserve. Next week, we'll explore biblical texts relative to this topic I will also next week tell you what happened at Whole, Wimp Whole Women's Health last Saturday. Does that sound like a shameless teaser to get you to worship next week? <laughs> I won't say it's not. I do not assume that everyone agrees with me. I'm not asking you to. I do want to offer insights from our faith tradition, from science, and from women's experiences so that you can take that into consideration. No matter how you feel, thank you for listening, for sticking with this conversation for another week or two. Amen. <laughs>